you've mentioned the Plato's cave allegory. Mm -hmm. So in case people don't know, it's where people are observing shadows of reality, not reality itself. And they believe what they're observing to be reality. Is that in some sense what mathematicians and maybe all humans are doing is um, looking at shadows of reality? Do, is it possible for us to truly access reality? Well, there are these three ontological things. There's actual reality, there's our observations, and our, our models. Um, a, and technically, they are distinct, and I think they will always be distinct. Um, right. But they can get closer um, over time. Um, you know, so, um, and the process of getting closer often means that you're you have to discard your initial intuitions. Um, so um, astronomy provides great examples, you know, like, you know, like your, an initial model of the world is that it's flat because it, it looks flat, you know, uh, and um, and that it's, and it's big, you know, and the rest of the universe, the skies is not, you know, like the sun, for example, looks really tiny. Um, and so you, you start off with a model which is actually really far from reality, um, but it fits kind of the observations that you have. Um, you know, so you know, so things look good. You know, but but over time, as you make more and more observations, bring it closer to, to, to reality, um, the model gets dragged along with it. You know, and so over time, we had to realize that the Earth was round, that it spins, it goes around the solar system, solar system goes around the galaxy, and so on and so forth. And the guys part of the universe is expanding. Um, the expansion is self expanding, <laughs> accelerating. And in fact, very recently in, in this year or so, uh, even the acceleration of, of the universe itself is uh, this evidence now that is non constant. And uh, the explanation behind why that is it's, is, it's it, catching up. Um, <laughs> it's catching up. I mean, it's still, you know, the dark matter, dark energy, yeah. this, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yes. We have, we have a model that sort of explains that fits the data really well. It just has a few parameters that um, uh, you have to specify. Um, but so you know, people say, "Oh, that's fudge factors." You know, with with enough fudge factors, you can, you can explain anything. Um, yeah, but, but uh, the mathematical point of the model is that um, you want to have fewer parameters in your model than data points in your observational set. So, if you have a model with ten parameters that explains 10, 10 observations, that is a completely useless model. It's what's called overfitted. But like, if you have a model with, with you know two parameters and it explains a, a trillion observations, which is basically, uh, so uh, yeah, the, the, the dark matter model, I think it has like 14 parameters and it explains petabytes of data um, that, 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 that the astronomers have. Um, you can think of, of a theory, uh, like one way to think about um, a physical mathematical theory, a theory is it's, it's a compression of, of the universe um, and a, a data compression. So, you know, you have these petabytes of observations, you like to compress it to a model which you can describe in five pages and specify a certain number of parameters. And if it can fit to reasonable accuracy, you know, uh, almost all of, of your observations, I mean, the more compression that you make, the better your theory. In fact, one of the great surprises of our universe and of everything in it is that it's compressible at all. That's the yeah. unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Yeah, Einstein had a quote like that. The, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Right, and not just comprehensible. You can do an equation like E equals MC squared. There is actually a, some mathematical possible explanation for that. Um, so there's this phenomenon in mathematics called universality. So many complex systems at the macro scale are coming out of lots of tiny interactions at, at the macro scale. And normally because of the common form of explosion, you would think that uh, the macro scale equations must be like infinitely, exponentially more complicated than, than the, uh, the macro scale ones. And they are if you want to solve them completely exactly. Like if you want to model um, all the atoms in a box of, of air, uh, that's like Avogadro's number is humongous. Right? There's a huge number of particles. If you actually have to track each one, it will be ridiculous. But certain laws emerge at the microscopic scale that almost don't depend on what's going on at the macro scale, or, or only depend on a very small number of parameters. So if you want to model a gas um, of you know quintillion particles in a, in a box, you just need to know its temperature and pressure and volume and a few parameters, like five or six. And it models almost everything you, didn't, you need, need to know about these 10 to 23 or whatever particles. Um, so we we have, um, we, we don't understand universality anywhere near as we would like mathematically, but there are much simpler toy models where we do um, have a good understanding of why univers universality occurs. Um, uh, most basic one is, is the central limit theorem. That explains why the bell curve shows up everywhere in nature, that so many things are distributed by what's called a Gaussian distribution, a famous bell curve. Uh, there's now even a meme with this curve. And even the meme applies broadly. There's yeah. universality to the meme. Yeah. Yes, you can go meta uh, <laughs> if you like. But there are many, many 
processes, for example, you, you can take lots and lots of independent um, random variables and average them together um, uh, in, in various ways. You, you can take a simple average or more complicated average, and we can prove in various cases that that these these bell curves, these Gaussians, emerge. And it is a satisfy, satisfying explanation. Um, sometimes they don't. Um, so, so if you have many different inputs and they're all correlated in some s systemic way, then you can get something very far from a bell curve show up. Uh, and this is also important to know when the statistical limit fails. So universality is not a 100% reliable thing to rely on. Uh, that, um, um, that the global financial crisis was a, a famous example of this. Uh, people thought that uh, um, mortgage de defaults um, uh, had this sort of um, Gaussian type behavior that that if you if you ask if a population of of, of uh, you know 100,000 Americans with mortgages, you ask what what proportion of them were default in their mortgages. Um, if everything was decorrelated, it would be a nice bell curve, and, and like you, you can you can manage risk with options and derivatives and so forth, and um, and it is a very beautiful theory. Um, but if there are systemic shocks in the economy uh, that can push everybody to default at the same time, uh, that's very non-Gaussian behavior. Um, and uh, this wasn't fully accounted for <laughs> in uh, 2008. <laughs> um, now I think there's some more awareness that this is a systemic risk is actually a, a much bigger issue. And uh, just because the model is pretty uh, and nice, uh, it may not match reality. Uh, so, so the mathematics of working out what models do is really important. Um, but um, also the, the science of validating when the models uh, fit reality and when they don't. Um, I mean, that you need both. Um, and, but mathematics can help because it, it can, it, uh, for example, these central limit theorems, it, it told you that, that if you have certain axioms like like, like uh, non-correlation, that if all the inputs were not correlated to each other, um, then you have these Gaussian behaviors, so things are fine. It, it tells you where to look for weaknesses in the model. So if you have a mathematical understanding of the central limit theorem and someone proposes to use these Gaussian copulas or whatever to, to model um, default risk, um, if you're mathematically... Um, trained, you would say, okay, but what are the systemic correlation between all your inputs? And so then the, then you can ask the economists, you know, how how, how much of a risk is that? Um, and then you can, you can you can go look for that. So there's always this this, uh, this synergy between science and, and mathematics.